and welcome to an exciting new edition of SVA 101. This is going to be covering specifically the necessities of the things to bring to an event and some things that are just helpful to bring to an event. This is not a full comprehensive list by any imagination, by any stretch of the imagination. This is just a small, the bare basics of what you're gonna need. So let's say you hypothetically went on to SCA.org, you found your group, you found out, hey, next month there's an event and I'm gonna go. Now, what do I need to bring? Step one, you need some site fee. Now, site fee is basically refers to money at the door. You're gonna need to pay like any concert, like any kind of Burning Man or any event like that, you're gonna need to pay some money. Uh, typically with smaller events, it's between 20 and 40 bucks. With the day site, with the day events, it'll be, you know, 10, 15, 20 max. At the wars, uh, Astrea is a good example of a little more, one of the more pricey ones. Astrea runs between 90 and $95 if you don't pre-reg. Uh, Pre-registration is something that typically only happens for the larger the wars. And pre-registration refers to you can online pay for the, uh, the site fee, pay the site fee online before the door, and you might save a little bit of money. I believe at Australia you'll save about 20 bucks when you pre-reg, and when you pre-reg, your group gets a little bit more land. So that's pre-registration right there. Uh, if not, you just pay at the door just like a concert, you pay site fee, you get what is a, called a site token. It's a little necklace or a little button that you can like put on a pouch, it basically just says, hey, I paid my site fee, here's my site token, I'm allowed to be here. If you have to leave site, you take that with you, when you come back, you show them, they let you right back in, just like that. It's just the easiest way for us to say, hey, you paid. It's also super cool because you get a little coin or a token or a little mold. We've had uh, casts of shovels and casts of sheep and uh, treasure chests before. So you get these little, you know, medallions, these little things that you can uh, attach together, attach to a mug I've seen. There's a lot of different ways you can use your site tokens as a way to show your story of who you are and how long you've been playing. So it's a cool little thing that you get. It's a little more than, you know, a little stub from a concert ticket that you put in a scrapbook. It's something that you can carry around a little piece of your history. So you paid your site fee. You're in the door. Boom! Welcome to the event. Next up, you're going to need to set up a tent. Now, you either have talked with whoever you've talked with to figure out this event is happening. So you might be camping with a particular household, or you might be camping on baronial lands, or even on kingdom lands. You might be camping with the kingdom. If you haven't, with any of those, you're not familiar with any of those terms, and you're like, no, I'm on site and I don't know where I should go, you're going to ask for overflow. Overflow refers to the area of land set aside for anyone who doesn't have a particular group that they play with. They don't play with any baronial factions or anything like that. Uh, loners or just someone who just came spur of the moment. A lot of different reasons, a lot of different groups camp in overflow. If you have a smaller household, you know, a little group of like three or four people, sometimes it's easy as just to camp as a household in overflow as opposed to having to get your land via talking with the autocrats and discussions with that, and etc. and so on. Won't go so much into all of that. Save that for yet another video. So, if you know what group you're going to be camping with, make for that group. If you don't, ask for overflow and make for overflow. Anywhere in overflow, you can set your stuff. Uh, they ask for respect, don't take up 8 billion miles of land, try to keep yourself generally well contained, and set up your tent. Now you're looking around and you're saying, wow, these are a lot of canvas tents, there's a lot of wooden poles, and these all look like what period people would have uh, uh, camped in. Do I need a period tent? Now the answer to that is no! You can bring any old thing you want! Uh, with, you know, some exceptions, obviously. You can bring just a basic instant, just a pop-up tent, you know, a couple of poles, the, you know, Coleman or Ozark or any of those that you get at the Big Five for 30 bucks, a little two-man tent, good to go. 
Just something to keep the rain off you and keep the wind away. That's all we're looking for. A little bit of shelter for you. Once you've got your shelter, you can put a bed inside. Uh, I suggest putting a sleeping bag, preferably with the uh, deep cold, I don't remember what they're called, like the thick insulation, the ones that are designed for the colder extremes. Uh, it's not necessary, but uh, it is just a little helpful thing that even if you don't need it, it helps. I also suggest bringing extra bedding. As much room as you have, just bring extra bedding. Cram them into the little corners of your car or wherever. You might be saying, but I camp in a really hot place. I camp down in Texas or, or another hot region. Remember, I camp in Arizona. I also go to Estrella War, which is down in the heart of Phoenix. It's actually not in the heart of Phoenix. It's south of Phoenix in Queen Creek, if you know where that is. The point being, it gets hot down there, but also in the desert, it gets bitterly cold. And you never know when one of those swings are going to happen. It might have been 90 degrees the entire two months leading up to it. But for whatever reason, when we're out there and we're camping, one night it gets down to 32 or it gets down to 19 or some other ungodly number. And people who play up in the Great Lakes are all 19. That's a hot summer day. What are you talking about? So... Regions are accustomed to different extremes, but prepare for both extremes. Because for whatever reason, you never know when it's going to swing in one way or the other. So always, always, always bring more bedding than you think. I cannot begin, I cannot begin to express how many times people have been just freezing out of it, just shaking. And they have one little thin sleeping bag and a thin little blanket uh, in their bed. And I know, because my first couple years, I wound up doing that, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so, and if it's hot, that just means you now have a thick bedroll. You have super thick bedroll. So, boom. Alright, so, getting off that tangent, because I'm trying to keep this video short, you now have a tent, you now have a bed. Uh, and a bed that is hopefully going to be accommodating enough for the coldest of whatever your region might have. After that, you're going to need... Food and water. You're going to need to eat and you're going to be drinking water. Those are very easy, but if you don't know what you're doing, very easy to mess up. For water, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm just going out for a weekend. I'll just bring a flat of water. And you might be okay. You might not as well because you don't think, oh, well, I need water to boil my mac and cheese. I need water to wash my hands because my hands are filthy right now. I need water to... So suddenly that flat of water that would have been fine if you were only drinking it, you've just burned through on your first night. So it's important to invest in at least one, when you first start, of those five-gallon jugs. The big old five-gallon jug. I suggest ponying up the extra four dollars and get the ones with a spigot. It helps exponentially with the kitchen working. You don't need it. Similarly to how you don't need a cooler, and a two-burner to make a kitchen work. You can just have dry goods, you know, have, you know, just some peanuts and some fruit and just easy things like that you can snack on and eat. But you really ultimately wind up paying for it. You know, later, the next night, basically. So I suggest investing in a nice cooler and a nice two-burner. Doesn't need to be super fancy, but a nice... $30 two burner that you know is going to be good. If you can get one with a couple year warranty, that's awesome. Uh, the two burners, once again, the ones that screw into the uh, little green propane tanks, that's all, you little, that's all you need. Just a little one to cook up a little bit of food for you. Fun fact, my father actually fed a, a household of just under 20 or so with a little two burner. So those are a lot mightier than you believe. So... If you've got a family, a little family of four, family of six, those two burners, as long as you know what you're doing, can be pretty good and pretty effective. Uh, so, there you have it. you got your, hopefully, uh, five-gallon water jug. you got a two-burner, uh, ice chest. you got a crate of box goods, you know, some macaroni, things that are relatively easy for cooking on. Another thing you can do is make meals beforehand, freeze them at home, and then just thaw them out as you need. 
So there's a lot of ways you can make your kitchen work and make it work easy, quickly, and efficiently. You just got to troubleshoot it a little bit. See what do you want to do? What kind of food do you want to be eating at events? A lot of people want to go, period, and actually eat what would have they eaten back in the day. And you can customize your food to that. Or you can just, you know, I want bacon, eggs, and hash browns for breakfast in the morning. You can do that too. It's all about finding the balance of efficiency and not being weighed down with your kitchen. And that's a real delicate tight, uh, tight rope to walk. The important part is to the first couple of events, make sure you have enough water. Plenty, plenty, plenty of water. Uh, if you have an ice chest, a little cheat for you is get uh, just a one-gallon water jug. Freeze it. If you have a deep freezer, those work amazing. If not, just freeze it in your freezer. Once those are fully frozen, it's going to keep your ice chest about two times longer than a bag of ice from the store. And that's because it's really, really frozen solid. So if you're going to be going out for a week-long event, get a couple of them, have them really frozen, and that way they keep your ice chest uh, really cold for a longer period of time. When you talk with people, everyone's going to have little tips and tricks and hacks like that. So if you're walking by, you see someone doing something cool in their kitchen, be like, oh, what do you, how do you do that? What is it? Explain how to me how that works. Um, the kitchen is the hardest and also the easiest to simplify. Uh, it's just completely different than the kitchen you're going to be at ho doing, using at home. So it's about highlighting the things you can do and negating the things that are going to be more difficult for you. Uh, I'll probably have a separate video on the kitchen, but there you have it. You have site fee for your cover charge at the door, you have your food, you have your water, you have your shelter, and you have your bed. Those are the only real necessities. I'm probably going to make a separate video on all the little things that are going to make your gameplay helpful and a lot easier. But to go to an event and to go and have a great time and to not freeze and to not just die of thirst and to not, to make sure you're taken care of, that's what you need. Everything else is just gravy. Uh, so this is Warwick saying, I can't wait until I see you out there. Have a great one.